Thank you. So we are going to be um, continuing our testimony and turn to, you'll always be Representative Kaya Morris. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so welcome Kaya Morris, who um, who had to call in. Um, I'm so sorry that we didn't get you in sooner, but I'm so glad that you are able to join us, and I appreciate your your flexibility. So welcome. Thank you. No problem. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, Chair and Committee members, and thank you, Daniel and. Um, Melissa for your testimony earlier. So my name is Kaya Morris and I am the Movement Politics and Policy Director for Rights and Democracy Vermont. Um, just for introduction for those tuning in, Rights and Democracy is a member-led people's organization working in New Hampshire and Vermont. Our mission is to shift the political landscape through electoral and community organizing to ensure that the values and the needs of our communities guide the policies of our government. And we're doing this by building a popular movement to advance human rights, dismantle economic inequality, racism, sexism, and to build a real democracy. So I'm here obviously to provide testimony with regards to H644, which seeks to decriminalize a number of substances which currently hold various penalties for use or distribution. Yeah. This bill is- Somebody turn it up. Sorry? We can't, um, we want to get the volume up, but um, can't hear you as, some of us can't hear you as well as we'd like to. Oh, you're not able to, Amber, you're not able to turn up? Okay, so um, it, are you able to um, either speak louder or get closer to your microphone? It's it's um it's turned up as loud as we can go here in the room. That One moment. Better? Oh, that's, okay. that's, that's better. better. That's better. Thank that's you, good. Kaya. Thank you. Okay, are we, are we still coming in clear? Yes, yes, it's great. <clears throat> okay, fantastic, thank you. So um, I appreciate your time. So this bill is of great importance to Vermont to meet with our values of wanting to recognize that substance use and substance use disorders are not criminal acts but are a matter of public health, personal preference and choice, and for some mechanisms for alternative medicines as desired. We are well aware of the data and the information supplied through research in Vermont and nationwide on the impacts of our policies regarding substance use. In particular, particular, the cascading negative impact on those who hold marginalized identities, such as those classified by race, gender identity, or income status. Decriminalization of substance use is necessary as economic equality remains a vision instead of a lived reality and racial justice is as far from realization within the criminal justice system in the state as it could possibly be. The hyperbolic hysteria that was created around and weaponized in the devastating <laughs> war on drugs has had generational impacts that negatively affect us all. Families torn apart, deaths of Vermonters, economic systems pushed to the brink and community fabrics pushed to their limits. Even when drugs have been reimagined, such as within medicinal cannabis use, some still choose to not engage in its use at all, even where there are proven health benefits because of the social stigmas embedded in the messaging of substance use. This will not change until our relationship to substance use is fundamentally transformed. The stigma is what may keep those in need of help from seeking help. Creating spaces for different conversations around use are crucial to help capture those who are in need of that treatment for misuse or disorders. Now at the nexus of criminal justice and social equity is an opportunity to address these harms and to move forward in a progressive manner which supports our communities and better addresses the public health needs and desires of those who live and work in Vermont. H644 does support that work and Rights and Democracy is in support of this bill's passage. As a reminder, this bill does not go as far as to eliminate all of the barriers towards a just society, nor does it refrain from imposing a legality around substance use. Still, this is a truly important moment and the crucial and crucial, which is apparent from both the number of signatories onto this bill and the organizations and entities that will come forth in support of this work. An important part of rights and democracy's theory of change is in bringing those who have been kept to the margins of 
the centers of the place where decision-making power lives and bringing them there in as peers and as representatives of the communities from which they come. This is achieved meaningfully through the composition of the board itself as written in the bill. So the bill creates an advisory board to support overseeing changes to current law around drug use and distribution and to advise actions that the Department of Health may take in their rulemaking efforts. With regards to the advisory board, there's always a cautioning in having an entity whose sole purpose is to provide input to the state without a provision or mechanisms for enforcement or reinforcement of that very work. Noting that there is an important space for consumers of substance use that will bring a much needed voice to this advisory board, I still see a kind of strange circular pattern in having many of the harm reduction service providers nominate those individuals rather than a broader self-identification of those interested in this work. This is particularly awkward when there will be seats from the same harm reduction service providers onto the board itself. But I greatly appreciate and am encouraged by providing the opportunity for those from the substance use community to be able to shape the remainder of the advisory board itself. Now, a question that I do hold, though, is that the actions of the board include providing recommendations for rulemaking, but do not make require any communication back or reporting back to the board to ensure consistency with those same benchmarks and the intent of the recommendations the board puts forth. So I'm unclear a little bit about the frequency of how often this group will need to review those rulemaking changes, as they're sometimes dynamic, and that it's is it just expected to occur during the once annual meeting as currently stated in the law or further? An additional question is whether or not that singular meeting would be sufficient enough to also provide the continuity of community engagement that is expected for this level of work. An important function of establishing citizen-led boards in service to the state is to also ensure that those individuals are seated in a way that enables them to actually be direct liaisons back to the communities that they're representing. It's not enough for these decisions to place them in a segregated space that doesn't allow for the communities they represent to see those same persons as a means of ongoing community engagement so that they can reach out to them with regards to concerns, ideas or questions about those recommendations they will make. And finally, as these boards are often seen by the general public as a function of the state government, it can be discordant to create advisory boards that have no actual power. The perception of the public, the average Vermonter, is that those who are appointed to such boards are actually, in fact, empowered to enact meaningful change. So ensure that those pro positions do provide that key component of needed societal change for our state to chart that new course with care and to build a sense of trust in the system again. I appreciate the opportunity to testify with regards to this bill and um, Rights and Democracy is here and available to help support any additional testimony or witnesses that you would like to have come and provide input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I especially appreciate your comments about the advisory board and and um, I know you'll be very helpful as we can continue to work through what what that might look like. Uh, and that is a very important piece um, as we move forward with this with this conversation. Um, you know, in light of all the work we're doing in terms of drug reclassification, not just this bill, but H505, and as we try to work on the recommendations from the Council of State Government. So I do see that advisory board, um, some, some, some group, um, with especially with the um, protections that, that you were referring to, um, could be very useful in, in this process. Uh, any questions or not seeing any? Mar uh, sure, Martin. Yeah, just a quick question. I, do, you, do you have suggestions on uh, language on how to improve or you know, just general, doesn't have to be specific uh, legislative council approved language, but could you precisely point out where you think uh, we could change uh, as far as the concepts in the language of this bill? And I'm not asking you to do that right now, but if that is something you could provide us. <coughs> To address those concerns you just mentioned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, so this is a, I will be um, frank that this, some of these recommendations that I'm making with regards to thinking about 
the role of board members, both within um, the advisory function in and of itself of that entity, but also their relationship back to the communities. It's something that I'm speaking more broadly to state government period around. Um, we've just seen how that has, this is a, an important moment, I think, as GovOps and um, is really trying to look at the composition of our boards and commissions and thinking about the role that they play as a function of state government. Um, so, you know, if I was to say, I mean, I, I was trying to think through how to fix kind of the circular piece that comes through in um, having the nominations again coming from the the initial nominations for those um to appoint the three consumer representatives that's i think on page eight and like that section down there line 20 ish or so um so what i saw that just seems strange is like who are the harm reduction service providers that are going to choose these other individuals when they then will have seats on the board it feels like it's going backwards you know so um will those particular service providers then get preference as far as their appointment because they selected the consumers um, I also know that from the much ex experience that I've had and not only working within the legislature outside the Climate Council and many other places that are trying to do community engagement is that there's so much more expertise and genius that we don't know yet. And so I'm always looking for opportunities to allow for people themselves to say, this is a worthwhile project that I want to be a part of. And that's how they identify themselves um, as wanting to be considered for um, the appointments. I'm appreciative that we didn't also just require that the legislature does all the appointments as we typically do for these boards and commissions, but placing the public in that seat of um, important power on really kind of vetting who's going to be able to help support doing nuanced and um, thoughtful work. Um, this is going to take adjustment for everyone, right? So I think that's the piece there that I, um, there, there might be, I don't know the history behind why it ended up that way. So that's something that I am missing. That might have already been figured out and deliberated, and I'm just coming in new to, under, to seeing that. Um, the other piece of this, too, though, is that we are talking quite a bit about um, possession and dis um, dispensing. There was a strange part. Let me take a look. I apologize. I'm in the car holding the phone waiting for my kid to come out of school. But there was a place that spoke to, um, I think, well, actually, it's a general writing. It's a general pattern where it's those who are, um, if you are essentially encountering law enforcement for possession or for distribution, that there's an immediate health assessment that happens in there. Um, and I feel like it doesn't speak to what's happening economically as to why folks may be um, distributing or selling selling um, these drugs that we're talking about. Um, I don't, you know, the, the health components, I think, while it is, we are looking at the social determinants, so it sort of implies that there's a question around what's happening um, economically for the individual. I feel like it makes an assumption that those who are distributing are automatically engaged in substance use disorder or misuse. Um, so I, I don't know if that captures the spirit of what I think we were trying to, what, what I think the um, bill drafters were trying to do with that piece, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think I saw that in many different places where it was essentially a health assessment. So, um, and then also seeing that the health assessment is, I, I'm appreciative that it is optional, um, but recognizing that, um, yeah, we are trying to build a readiness to change and those who are ready to seek help. But I also want to consider what are the other factors that are um, leading to that particular point of um, intersection with law enforcement, that they would then suddenly be engaged in this. Um, so I think that might be what kind of comes to my mind there. Um, there also was not, if you are going to go back to the language around, and I'm sorry, I'm bouncing a little bit, but I'm trying to think through, the, around the board composition itself, again, having the consumers be there, I think is important. It could be key also to think about geographic spread. Um, also think about the identities of those that are going to be holding these seats um, so that we also ensure that it's not either mostly focused on a particular region of the state that has an easier ability to participate, um, nor that it's from a particular demographic that is deeply engaged in this work, um, as that just makes a presumption that there aren't others who would want to do this work that just may not be in communities, um, with the recovery community, for, for a variety of reasons. Thank you. 
Any, uh, anything else? Martin, anything else? Okay, Anybody on Zoom that um, that's my hands up? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for your flexibility. And always, always good to see you and, and hear your voice. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, committee. And thank you, Chair. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, thank you. So I'm not seeing Mr. Diaz. Jay Diaz? He had to hop off. He did. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you.